Hey folks, welcome back to the Speaker Builder channel. Today we're talking all about interconnect cables. I call them audio signal cables because that's what they do. And uh, why are we talking about input cables in a channel on speaker as well? Obviously, those of us who are building speakers, we have various components we're playing music through and those components must be connected together. So this is an issue that's unavoidable. We've got to figure out we got to buy some kind of an input cable and plug it into our various components to carry signal from one to the other. And so it's relevant for all of us to into hi-fi to ask what difference does it make whether you buy this cable or that? Can you really hear any difference? So that's the question we're going to be grappling with. Uh, first of all, uh, let me do the headline. And the headline, just like with the speaker wire video I did, uh, these different kind of cables use different kind of wire, different topologies. Uh, they're manufactured with different materials. And all of that's going to make a difference in how the signal is handled. So the question is not whether there is a difference. Rather, the question is whether we can hear the difference. Uh, so that's what we're going to really be grappling with. We're going to do some, a we'll talk about A-B testing and whether I could hear a difference and what that difference was. We'll get into all that. Lots to talk about first before we get into that. First, let's talk about the price range that we're dealing with. We're not going all the way into the stratosphere. We're starting down here at the bottom with cheapy cables you can probably buy for two bucks. I was, you, you get these for free from when you buy components. All the way up to the Supra cables that I bought from Mattisound for 160 bucks. So that's the price range I'm working in. Everything else was less than that. And so that's the world that I'm operating in. I'd recommend that's the world most of us should be in. Uh, there are input cables you can purchase for hundreds of dollars, even thousands of dollars. The guys over at Audio, uh, Audioholics, Gene and those guys, they scoff at this crazy stuff about these extremely expensive audio cables that are with all these crazy things. That and they've got people buying that stuff, so it's crazy. For me, it simply comes down to the economics of the matter. If I have, have a $500 CD player it's running a signal into a $500 preamp and then into a $1,000 electronic crossover or whatever, if that's the range I'm in, it makes no sense to me to spend $500 on an interconnect cable. I don't care how clean it is. It's just crazy math. So uh, it does make sense to me to spend $100, 150 dollars for a cable but not not hundreds and hundreds for the the rest of you out there who might not be down at up at that range if you're down at a few hundred dollars per component then it doesn't make sense to spend 150 dollars on an inter, interconnect cable to connecting components that cost 150 dollars or 200 dollars so you have to stay within reason i think just from the a rational standpoint it makes no sense to go too crazy but uh so and the other issue we'll get into later is that you might not be able to hear the difference anyway if you're down at the lower end versus the upper end. So uh, we'll get into all that. So this price range is down here at the in, in the and down here on Earth, not up in the stratosphere. Uh, so uh, let me talk about balance versus unbalanced, because one of the differences here that we will see in input cables has to do with that. One of the wise gentlemen who uh, uh, commented on a recent video I did about this issue, I touched on it in a recent video, and he talked all about uh, balanced inputs in a uh, amplifier. And that's a whole other whole world. I, I don't know all about that so much, but I can tell you there is a difference between balanced and unbalanced input cables. And uh, my guess is that that difference is sonically noticeable. Otherwise, manufacturers wouldn't be developing them because they don't make a big deal about the fact that these cables are balanced. Some of them don't even mention the word. And so, but they all are balanced with the exception of the cheapy ones. So let's talk just briefly about what that difference is. So with an unbalanced line, you have a signal going through the center core of the line, and then you have shielding on the outside that must be there to shield against RFI, radio frequency interference. Uh, all, all of us living in houses have AC wiring in the walls, and that AC wiring produces a field, and that any line hooked up to an amplifier on the other end will uh, respond to that field and take that signal that's, that will excite this line, line unshielded and amplify that and create hum. 
and those of us into pro audio, working in bands and stuff, we've all heard the hum of a line that was not grounded properly. So this shielding shields against that hum, and so it must be connected. Now, what's in an unbalanced line, the signal is carried through the plus, and then it has to, of course, go back because the signal, of course, is just going back around through a, through a circuit here, right? And it's, the electrons going here aren't the ones that actually get amplified. The, the, the input transistor amplifies that signal uh, an, in an analog, creates an analog, an amplified analog version of that signal. And so uh, the, the, the electrons stay in this, from, in this component, just going around from plus to minus. So the signal is carried by one kind of wire going this way and by a different kind of wire and a different, completely different topology going back. So it's fundamentally unbalanced. And my take from this is uh, these guys who are building these cables recognize the advantage of creating a balanced line. In a balanced line, you have two lines in the center of this shielded cable. And they carry the plus and then they go back to minus in the same kind of wire, the same makeup. And so it's balanced. And the shielding then is only connected to one end of this cable. And that component will produce the shielding across the cable input lines. And uh, what's really, what I find interesting though, is that some manufacturers ground this end, the receiving end, gets the, gets the, the connection to the shielding. And in some other cables, the sending component is, is uh, grounded with shield. And so that's really interesting that sometimes, you know, all those uh, balanced single cables will have an arrow will tell you which way to go, which way the signal should go. And when the arrow is pointing this way, obviously this is the sending component on this end and the receiving component on the other end where the arrow point points in. So let me talk about the various cables that I have here, starting with the cheapy one, the probably a couple dollars for these. Uh, they get, they come for free and a lot of components you buy. So obviously that's gonna be the bottom line and something to avoid. Uh, next up is the, I don't know if I got these at Radio Shack or where I got these. They have gold plated connectors on it and they say OFC cable, oxygen free copper cable, but there's no name on it. And whoever made them was too embarrassed to put their name on those. And they're, not, they're probably not balanced because there's no arrow indicating which direction they should go. That's an indication of unbalanced line. Everything else here is balanced, starting with, uh, next up, the Mogami cables that I made. And I just bought the connectors and I made these. And, uh, and I made these balanced, so I have these little arrows I put on them. And so they're connected, uh, they're grounded at the uh, receiving end. The shielding is grounded at the receiving end, not at the transmitting end. That's how I thought they should all be made. And so uh, they go like that. These are four, it's a, it's a, microphone cable, high quality microphone cable, and it's got four leads in there, and then you connect the, these two and these two for plus and for minus. So that's kind of how, they, how they're wired together. And so uh, I had a cable I saw for about 30 bucks of one meter length that uh, used the same wire. So uh, those are available. Uh, next up is the Belden cable. About the same thing I had to buy. This was a little bit more money. Uh, because of uh, this was four and a half feet instead of three. I don't know why I couldn't buy a three foot cable in Belden, but star quad, so it's what four leads in it. This is the 1192A cable. The outer core is not great. It's just kind of it feels like cheap cable, but 35 bucks. I mean, it, uh, the guys at Audioholics say you should be at least in this range spending 30, 35 bucks for the, uh, the cable that used the Mogami wire or the Belden. Either of those would be in that good, uh, good range, kind of as a minimum. Next up for me is the Monster Cable. Uh, I don't remember how much I spent for this. I bought a two meter length and I cut it in half and used the other pieces for other things and then I just put my own connectors on here, shorten this. Uh, so there's that one and then next, the next two up are the AudioQuest cables. These are uh, the turquoise. You can't get these, of course. The names change every couple of years with AudioQuest. Uh, they do have to make money. There's nothing wrong with making money, but, uh, and audio, I found the AudioQuest to be quite good in quality, and I certainly could, could confirm that with my testing, and we'll get into the details of my testing in just a bit, but that's, uh, these are balanced line. This was a two meter 
a cable because this was when I was into recording. I was uh, I needed to go run a long length from my uh, from the from the Motu a Motu up off camera here to uh, my uh, uh, reproduction system, and there was a long run there. So I ran. I bought this two meter cable. Uh, normally I try to run short lengths, but that, that's the turquoise anyway. That was a that was in the that was like the second or third line up from the bottom for audio quest at the time the next notch up from the turquoise was the ruby i bought a bunch of this stuff this ruby cable again these are all balanced they got the little arrows on the end telling you which way it should go and these are all uh, grounded shielded at the receiving end all this all the all the audio quest is done that way and then at the last at the very top is this a uh, super cable i mentioned i spent 150 160 dollars for this really nice line and these connectors are really amazing uh it has a uh, i don't know if i can let me go up close and i'll we'll look at this real close so it has a has a uh, a cowl on the end and when you turn this and adjust it and tighten it it squeezes down here at the at the and clamps down on the uh, connector so a a it won't pull out and b you get a nice gas tight connection so that's the first time i've seen that kind of a uh, connector and it's absolutely amazing. So that's probably the best connectors I've ever seen in an audio cable uh, So that's really nice material. It's really nice connectors uh, So and I was really hopeful that those would perform very well very well now Let me talk about the uh, testing procedure that I used uh, That's actually important if you're going to ever do this on your own good idea if you have a couple of different cables do some a B testing uh, first, my, uh, my thought was to start with very clean music. Now, I don't want to just use one source of music. I want multiple sources. I had about five or six or eight. Uh, I thought about sharing those with you. It doesn't really matter. Uh, find really good quality music where the recording is very, very clean, something you think is really, really super clean uh, in comparison to all the other stuff you have. I like to use CDs when I'm doing this because I want to just jump back and forth and plug different CDs in and out. I could use LPs, but that's fine. Uh, and I'm starting with a good quality, clean CD player and uh, so forth. And then the cable I ran from my uh, preamp into my electronic crossover. And the reason why I chose that signal path, there is obviously a cable from my CD player into the preamp and then there's multiple cables coming out of my electronic crossover to the various three amplifiers. So there's a lot of cables involved, but if I thought if I just changed out one of those cables, I would choose the one that carried the full frequency spectrum. If I tried to do this just with the high frequency amplifier cable, swapping those out, I'd only be, he only be hearing differences in high frequency. So I wanted to hear the full range. I kind of did that with the speaker wire I, I, I chose full range speakers, passive speakers for my testing. In this case, I chose a, a, a point within the signal chain in which the full frequency spectrum is carried, and that is from the preamp to the uh, electronic crossover. Uh, and those are all one meter. It happens to be all one meter. So I needed one meter lengths, so I bought a one meter lengths. My intention was to replace, these are the rubies that are in that signal path uh, currently in my top of the mountain system. And my intention was to replace those with the supers, uh, assuming the supers would be much cleaner and because they're much more expensive than the rubies. I may have spent a hundred bucks on the rubies. Uh, I know there's a difference between these, the turquoise and the ruby. I've heard that difference in the past. Okay, so uh, the other thing I was able to do, and uh, you wanna do A-B testing here. I have in my preamp two outputs, two, uh, uh, exactly the same outputs and it's designed to run different amplifiers and you can do different things so i was able to plug two cables in two sets of cables into the two sets of outputs and then plug one of those into the electronic crossover and then take a piece of music listen to about a minute or two of it and then swap out the cables with the other one that i wanted to a b test against and then listen to that same passage of music again for another couple of minutes. I'm listening to high frequency response, low frequency response, clarity, you know, how much life it had, all of those kind of things. 
So that's kind of what I was doing. You probably, if you don't have two outputs on your, on your, uh, on whatever component you're going between, you're going to have to swap out both at the same time. That's fine. Uh, that would be the kind of way to do this. To, uh, and then you don't just rely upon one piece of music you want to do. I did it with five or six or seven different kinds of music. I listened to this piece, swap the cables back and forth, and then put a different piece of music in and swap cables back, the same cables back and forth to see what I can hear. Uh, so let me talk then, jump right into the results. Uh, there is something very important we need to understand. And so I'm going to go through a metaphor here to describe this. Uh, we might think that with cables, we might be tempted to use the chain metaphor. You know, uh, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. I've actually pulled one car with another using chain, and if one chain link were weak, it would break there, right, at that weak link. That's not an apt metaphor for us here for audio uh, signal. Rather, I would use in the audio signal path the metaphor of sheets of glass through which you're trying to see uh, whatever is lit on the other side. And if you have a whole bunch of pieces of glass that are relatively uh, muted, they're, they're, they're dirty, they're colored, they're, they're tinted in some way, then if you take one of those pieces of glass out and swap it out, uh, maybe a fairly dirty one with a much cleaner one, you're probably not going to see much difference. Because that one clean piece of glass is not going to really add up to uh, much difference compared to all the other equally dirty pieces or, or colored pieces of glass, right? Uh, you'd have to have all clean pieces of glass and then one dirty one and then swap that dirty one out with a clean one and then you'll see the difference. So that's kind of what's going on here with trying to see what difference there is in these audio cables. True with speaker wire as well. True in many of these components. I swapped amplifiers out and if you don't have a clean signal path all the way through, any of these one components, if you swap it out, A, B, test it, you won't see a difference. You have to make sure that all of the uh, you know, and there's no such thing, of course, as perfectly clear glass all the way through, metaphorically, right? There's no such thing as a perfect signal path all the way through. All the components in your signal chain are colored in some way or other. The issue is, if it's so colored that uh, swapping out one, you might not produce any audible difference, and that's the issue. So generally speaking, at a, for the lower budget system, you're going to have, you're going to expect to, to, that you're going to have more colored, more uh, constrained kinds of components in your signal chain. And then swapping out one very clean with a dirty one is not going to be noticeable. So that's the issue. Whereas what I've done with my top of the mountain system, I've meticulously gone through every single component in the signal chain, cleaned it all up, spent the money you know, $500 per component. And in fact, the signal chain includes all of these rubies, which I spent some decent money on and I suspected they were clean. And so everything in my signal chain is very clean. And so if I put one dirty piece of glass in that signal chain, like one of these or something, it's gonna be noticeable to me. Now, we have to make sure we understand these differences are not dramatic, they're not huge, they're small. There's a small difference but it is for me a noticeable difference because of my system. So if someone else comes along and says, I swapped out whatever cable with whatever other cable and it made no difference to me, it probably didn't make any difference to them, their system. Uh, or, they, or maybe they couldn't hear the difference or maybe there's another third variable, maybe their signal source wasn't so clean that it revealed the difference. So you gotta have a good clean signal source, a, a recording that's exceptionally clean. I have a bunch that are just okay, others that are good, and some that are exceptional. And so I use the exceptional ones when I do this testing. And then you have to have a well-developed set of ears to hear that difference. You've got to really hone in, sit and pay attention and, and, and hear that. And then you have to have a signal chain that's clean all the way through, where if you, put a, if you swap out a dirty with a clean piece of glass, you'll see the difference. Or set it in the audio world, if you swap out a dirty component with a clean one, you'll hear the difference. So that's the deal here. I'm operating at a very high end with a lot of money spent, $5,000 on that top of the mountain system spent. And, and I know the components are clean. I've been systematically over the past couple of years testing them and making sure what I have here. And this is one of the last uh, tasks in that was to really sort of put these rubies to the test and see if they really pass the muster and see how much difference there is. So that's kind of what we're at. Uh, so this difference is small, but let me kind of go through 
uh, the, the issue was I bought, as I said before, I bought these super cables for 180 bucks, $160, and I hoped that they would be cleaner than the Rubies. And I had no idea. I never really sort of A-B tested the Rubies against anything else. Well, it was surprising to me that when I put, I put in the supers, having spent the money on these, that they were not as clean. These are cleaner. There was a significant difference, in fact. Here are my notes. Uh, I made notes on this so I can keep track of it. Uh, they were poor. Poor in the base clarity, poor in the high frequency clarity compared to the rubies. Now again, I can hear that difference because I'm running these very, very, very bright tweeters in an active arrangement. If I went back to a very inexpensive passive two-way passive speaker or something, I might not hear. If any difference, it'd be very small. It might, and it might not be worthwhile. I wouldn't probably care if the difference were small. But because of the end that I'm at, and again, as I said earlier, they may be $1,000 cables that would be even cleaner than the, than the rubies, but I'm not going to waste my time. That's crazy. I'm not going to spend the money. So the Supers did not perform as much as I love these connectors on these Super cables. And I love the material. They, wonder, they look nice. They feel real nice. They're really nice cables in a lot of ways. But they did not perform for me in my system. Unfortunately for me, then, the top line cable in this pile in front of us were these rubies. They outperformed everything else here. And that was surprising. It's another one of those accidents I just happened to have bought a whole bunch of this ruby. Every single cable I have in my signal chain is made of the same exact. In fact, my turntable, I took the factory cables out of the turntable and bought a bought one of these cables, cut the ends off, and wired it, wired one end, you know, the other end is these connectors, but the other end is hardwired into the turntable. So my turntable even has this ruby stuff. So surprise, surprise, this is the cleanest stuff. It really performed screamingly well. Next, so whereas I had hoped these would be at the top, they are not at the top. They have been kicked out of first place. Rubies are in first place. And then surprise, surprise, the next cable, even though it's two meters instead of one meter, I don't think the length really matters that much, but these are in second place. They were the next notch down from the rubies. There was a difference. I could hear a small difference in these. Uh, they're pretty good, I my notes say, definitely flatter, and they're a bit boomy than the rubies. But they were close to the rubies, and they had punch and clarity. So. Uh, and of course, it's the same manufacturer, so we'd expect it to be pretty close. Uh, the next notch down then on my list, number three, surprise, surprise, was these monster cables. I thought monster was just kind of, eh, you know, so what? Maybe they wouldn't be all that great. They performed exceptionally well compared to, uh, to, compared to these others. So they are number three. They sounded wonderful. A bit better than the Belden's and the Neglets. Not a huge amount. Highs are nice, bass big and full. Uh, but there were less bass and less highs compared to the turquoise, these here, the turquoise ones. So they didn't quite measure up to the, to the uh, AudioQuest, the, lower, the, the more budget AudioQuest cables. Surprise, surprise. So AudioQuest, as I've always felt, they were the better cable. My testing has demonstrated that hands down. But um, anyway, monster cables that I thought were just cheap and then didn't, well, they weren't really of any significance. I didn't really care. I didn't think anything of them as being clean, and they were performed very, very well. Number four on my list then would be the Supers. They were down there. They were above the, the, the Belden's and the uh, Mogami cables. So they were number four, and then the Belden's were number five. And they were close between the Super and the Belden. And that's really... That's really terrible that for 160 bucks the cables performed about as well as a 30 32 dollar pair of the building cables so doesn't say much for the super sorry they just for my ears they did not perform as they needed to again i remember now what the differences i'm talking about is very fairly small just a little difference a little and for my system i'm trying to get every single notch out of my the clarity in my system and because I've already done that, spent the money, these differences matter. And then down at the bottom there was uh, the Neglets. They were about the same. The, the, the Mogami wires, about the same as the Belden. I didn't hear that much difference. And then, of course, the Oxford Free Copper ones. Uh, I made some notes 
when I plug these in, these uh, unbalanced lines in. I don't know, again, I don't know if they're Radio Shack, there's no name on them. And my notes say, uh, basically, I have a, my notes say, what happened to my stereo? It's broken. I mean, it's just unnatural highs. Uh, they're bright, bass is a bit boomy. It was just not refined musically. So, big surprise, it does matter. Now, again, you have to have a really clean system and use a really clean uh, signal source and really do your A-B testing carefully to hear that difference. But I don't know that uh, these, uh, I, I tested these and my notes say they were about the same. You would have thought these would be really terrible, but uh, now again, you could, if you, all you had is cheap cables, you're probably okay. I would go up to at least the Belden or the Mogami. You can buy Belden's and it was a three foot length that were, used the Mogami wire. So I would at least do that. Uh, but if you want to go chase down how much these monsters, and this again was bought many years ago, and I don't know what monster's making today. This does have a uh, Interlink 250 is what it says. So uh, uh, anyway, uh, audio processing, audio interconnecting cable. So uh, real surprise there. That's about all I have for today. Uh, any questions or thoughts, feel free to e uh, to uh, give me a note or something like that. Uh, and we will uh, see you all next time.